This episode kicks off a nebula discovering that Yondu has been brutally murdered of the Nova Corps, the unflinching bureaucratic side of which is represented primarily through Garth and Saul are willing to write the death off as good riddance to bad rubbish. Nebby knows better and begins conducting her own off-the-books investigation, starting with seeing what Yondu's signature Yaka Arrow has been up to. The arrow reveals a ginormous hologram of mysterious schematics that Nebby doesn't understand but Nova Prime implies on a secure line so you know it's serious, might be intimately connected to whatever dark forces are on the cusp of obliterating Xander before the night is up. This adds a useful ticking clock device to the investigation and a little clue for who the villain is, which is obvious anyway since Nebula's character arc is about her having lost everything and found the surrogate family and home, and the only way to put her through the ringer emotionally is to challenge that ideal. Nevertheless, Nebula goes through the motions, visiting an underground casino owned by Howard the Duck and bartended by Korg, take away Titty, at his most tolerable, who recognizes the hologram as a citywide mainframe core that conveniently contains the source code for Xander's planetary shield. In other words, someone wants to deactivate the shields and open Xander up to an invasion. Breaking into the mainframe and deleting the source code requires someone well-versed in bypassing Xandarian security, which turns out to be Yon Rog Jude Law. Nebby breaks him out of prison by inciting a riot, breaks into the mainframe by flooding it, and then connects her robot brain to the data core to delete the relevant data. Naturally, the character exclusively known for being a one-note villain turns out to be a one-note villain, betraying Nebula and leaving her to the mercy of the flooded mainframe and superheated, exploding data core which she's able to narrowly escape. When she splutters to safety above ground, she discovers that yon -Rog is working with Nova Prime, who has set the whole thing up to gift Xander to Ronan in exchange for a senior leadership position. Of course, she already has a senior leadership position, but don't worry about that. Nebby is able to escape and get back to the casino, where she teams up with Howard, Korg, and Groot to take down Nova Court before they can let Ronan through the shield. With Yanus Finn and Yaka Arrow, she leads her ragdag little team in taking down the traitors and stopping Ronan's invasion by closing the shield right on his fleet, something made possible by the fact that Nebula had already figured out what Nova Prime was up to and amended the codes Yon Rog stole. This is still a tough pill for Nebula to swallow though since she had come to love her adoptive mother and mentor, and it turns out she was vehemently anti-cyborg all along. Still, it's pretty in keeping with the holiday season to find out that someone you thought you knew was a bigot. Perhaps she had a few drinks beforehand. In the end, Nebula manages to find a family anyway. Sure, it comprises a duck, a rock monster, and a tree, but it's better than nothing. Episode 2 opens with a fighter plane in pursuit of a mysterious glowing object, one Peggy Carter tells the pilot to eliminate before it enters U.S. airspace. He misses his opportunity and the object plummets towards Earth, specifically New York City, where we learn we're not in the present day, but in 1988. The object barrels through the streets, coming to a stop in front of Grand Central Station. The object, it turns out, is a small space pod, which opens to reveal the aforementioned pubescent Peter Quill with eyes that glow and the power to levitate and explode a whole street's worth of cars with one wave of his hand. This, the Watcher tells us, is a Peter Quill whose grief and loss threaten to destroy humanity. But what exactly happened here? According to the Watcher, this is the universe where six months ago, Yondu didn't hesitate to hand Peter over to his father, Ego. Ego immediately confiscates Peter's Wapman, his one physical connection to his mom, and instead introduces Peter to the idea of the expansion, his plan to turn entire planets into extensions of himself, the same plan Ego tried to enact in Guardians of the Galaxy Vol. Two, only this time Peter is much younger and doesn't have the help of his friends to fall back on. At least not yet. At S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters, a middle-aged Peggy observes that any solar system Peter has already visited has succumbed to cosmic radiation within 24 hours. She proposes they put together a team to stop him, made up of the best Earth has to offer. Howard Stark is skeptical, but faced with no alternative, agrees they can give it a go. Their parents, of course. Peggy and Howard call Hank Pym, who is currently in a home taking care of his preteen daughter Hope, who doesn't agree with his assessment that cereal and potato chips make for a balanced breakfast. The bitter Hank has no interest in taking calls from Howard, still blaming S.H.I.E.L.D. for the death of his wife Janet, but one glance at the news, conveniently showing the destruction Peter caused, convinces him to change his mind. He packs up Hope and heads over to S.H.I.E.L.D.'s project, Pegasus headquarters, or he runs into a young Bill Foster, who has also been called in to deal with the Peter problem. Their bickering is brought to a halt when they're joined by another member of their team, the Black Panther himself, King Chaka, who only agreed to get involved because of the extraterrestrial nature of the threat. In that spirit, they've sent the Winter Soldier, something that is unremarkable to most of the team, 
but downright jeering to Peggy and Howard, who recognize Bucky Barnes in those cold, coal-rimmed eyes above the mask. They meet up with the final member of their crew, Dr. Wendy Lawson with the U.S. Air Force and Kree Star Force, who conveys them all to New York to find just how much destruction Peter left in his wake. The group makes it to Condé Island to find it ablaze and deserted, except for Peter, who's got himself a stuffed raccoon and is taking full advantage of having a theme park to himself. While Hank, Tachaka, and Foster try to corner him, Lawson heads over to Peter's ship to see what she can glean. Pine traps Peter in a swarm of flying bugs and uses them to direct him into the Hall of Mirrors. Peter's fear turns to anger when the stuffed raccoon gets damaged in the chase and suddenly three men with unprecedented technological access are in the fight of their lives with a preteen. Lawson arrives to bail them out, but it looks like Peter has the upper hand until Thor arrives and knocks him to the ground. They lock Peter up in the same cage that, in another universe, was used to house Loki, as Thor explains that Peter is responsible for the destruction of Asgard and Jotunheim, with Earth now the last of the realms left standing. He explains Ego's plan to the team, and shows them the seed he recovered from Missouri that would have consumed Earth had Ego and Peter triggered it. The good news is they can use Peter to get through the seedlings layer of cosmic protection. Hope uses her dad's shrinking tech to bust Peter out so he can return home to Missouri, and gives him her mom's Walkman as a parting gift. Hope then insists he's just a misunderstood kid like her. Hope is right, but it's a stretch to justify Peter having demolished all the other realms and most of New York on the way here and that. The Avengers need his celestial origins to bypass the cosmic protection around Ego's seedling and render it harmless, so a decision must be made about whether to capture him, talk him around, or, if you're the Winter Soldier, shoot him with a sniper rifle while he cries at this mother's grave. The time frame for making this decision is accelerated by the arrival of Ego himself, Peggy, in a tank, Thor, Foster, and Chaka fight back Ego's army of sand monsters while Hank and Wendy try to get through to Peter before the Winter Soldier shoots him. As it turns out, relating to Peter on the level of a sad child works, and Howard is able to appeal to Bucky's better nature and talk him out of shooting the kid dead. In case it wasn't obvious, this is all about grief. Peter is grieving for his mother, obviously. Hank is grieving the loss of his wife, so it can relate to him on that level. With Bucky, it's a little more complicated since he's grieving himself and the loss of his identity. But in all three situations, a problem shared is a problem halved. So Peter feels suddenly stable enough to confront his father and stop him from destroying Earth, which he does by absorbing the ceiling into himself and blasting his father's corporeal form into nothingness. The episode ends with Hope and Peter being given custody of Lawson's cat, Goose, who you'll recognize for obvious reasons, Thor leaving to battle the actual planet form of Ego as revenge for the destruction of Asgard and Bucky leaving the Winter Soldier mantle and eyeliner behind to go his own way. A much more truncated version of how he broke his programming in the MCU proper, but nice, nonetheless. What if Happy Hogan saved Christmas? The setup is simple. While the Avengers are out doing world-saving things, Happy Hogan has been saddled with the responsibility of organizing a Christmas party at Avengers Tower, helped by a fleet of automated Iron Man suits and Stark Industries intern Darcy Lewis. And yes, there are tons of jokes about Darcy never having a real job or leaving college. At first, it seems like the horror doers being substandard is the biggest threat to the evening, but that doesn't last long. Child director Maria Hill is concerned about GRVIs being temporarily shut down, which proves to be a valid worry since the absence of any security protocols allows Justin Hammer, still seething from his defeat at the end of Iron Man 2, to waltz into the building with a bunch of goons, hijack control of the security suits, and take everyone hostage. As if this wasn't obvious, Avengers Tower is in Akatomi Plaza here, Happy is John McClane, and Hammer is Hans Gruber. But there are other fun references too, like Happy crawling around the air ducts while ranting to himself, Darcy fulfilling a kind of Al Powell support role while she's out picking up Mascherano cherries, Reginald Vell Johnson even gets a name check, and various other nods and winks that'll be great fun to spot for anyone who loves the 1988 film. Hammer's endgame is to turn himself into a supervillain using the Hulk's blood, which ends up being accidentally consumed by Happy himself. This is where the episode veers away from being a straight-up retread of Die Hard and becomes much more of its own thing. John McClane might have had a lack of shoes and socks to contend with, but at no point did he ever transform into a giant purple abomination. The Avengers are in this episode, but their presence is barely felt by design. Iron Man, Natasha, and Steve Rogers aren't voiced by the usual suspects either, which is disappointing, but a very brief scene between Bruce Banner and Clint Barton makes up for it. But for the most part, Happy has left his own devices, relying on Darcy's quick thinking to target the mainframe in the basement and turn JRVS back online before he completely loses himself to his new Hulk form. The climax of the episode is a giant punch-up between Hulked out Happy, 
Hulky. Hulk Hogan and Hammer in the Hulkbuster armor while Darcy and Maria handle the tech issues and eventually the rest of the Avengers return to join in, assuming that Happy is the villain. Hammer's defeat recalls Hans Gruber falling out of the window, but Hulky catches him before he falls to his death. This is Marvel, after all.